Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. My chessable course on the Sicilian Kalashnikov variation is on sale at the moment. Do check it out. I'll put the links in the video description and in the comments as well. And I wanted to give you an update on the Kalashnikov because I saw this game played just uh, well just a few weeks ago and it is a positional masterpiece. Just check this out. This is great. So it's a rapid play game. David Paravian playing white, strong grandmaster, against Parham Maksudlu. Now, Maksudlu from Iran uh, often plays the Kalashnikov, and he's, some of his ideas that he's found are, are just superb in it. And, well, this variation with c4, this, this is very popular at the moment. White goes for the full clamp, basically just trying to restrain this d-pawn here. But the idea that Maksudlu really pioneered is playing with g6 and with knight f6. And, and he's played some superb games. I mean, I've given his game on the channel before. Um, wonderful game against Anand. I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the link to that game in, in the description as well. Um, so yes, this variation with g6, this has really been developed by Mark Sudlu. Some great games in it. So anyway, let's get back to this game. Um, Parabian plays with bishop d3. And, uh, well, many players, well, players have started playing like this. And it, I think, you know, it seems reasonable because it gives the e-pawn more support. But let's see how Mark Sudlu deals with this. So a6 pushes the knight back. Knight goes back to a3. Um, these knights kind of tread on each other's toes a little bit. I mean, it can go back to c3, but I mean, it, it sort of works out the same. Bishop g7, knight c3, and sometimes, I think particularly against bishop d3, you can put this knight on e7 so that it can potentially support the knight going into d4. It is possible, I think, particularly against bishop d3. But Maksudlu goes for knight f6, which is basically his idea. And it puts a little bit more pressure here. The knight sometimes flips around via d7 to c5, and it can sometimes even go out in this direction as well. Seems a little counterintuitive to block the bishop, but actually it works out extremely well. Now, Paravian goes for bishop g5. That's a little bit unusual. So it provokes h6. Now, if white exchanges, I mean, this is really what black wants, because having got rid of that dark squared bishop, it means that it's much easier to occupy these dark squares. No, the point of playing bishop g5 is to provoke this move. By the way, if the bishop goes back here, then black is going to have great fun by pushing those kingside pawns. Sometimes happens in the Kalashnikov because the center is pretty much fixed. And you can get away with leaving the king in the middle and pushing these pawns. And if f3, then queen b6, check, and you take the pawn on b2. Very nice. No, Pravin put the, the bishop back on e3. And here Mark Sudlu played rook c8. Now this was a rapid play game. I think perhaps in a, if he'd had more time to consider things, I think knight g4 is a, is a nice move. You want to take that dark square bishop. Bishop goes back. The knight is pushed away. And here, you know, I think there are kind of interesting options when this pawn is on h3. You can perhaps play knight h5 and queen h4. Or knight d7 and queen h4, and don't forget the f pawn. You know, I think black can actually get quite a nice initiative on the king side because that pawn is feels a little vulnerable. Anyway, Mark Sudlu played rook c8. And knight d5. So this white can play.
play this when the bishop is on d3 because the bishop is supporting the e4 pawn. And here one could just castle. I also think it's possible to play knight d4. But it's a rapid play game and I think in rapid play you want clear plans. You, you don't want to sort of mess about. So Matsuglu simply exchanged off the knight on d5. And now here is a very important moment that often occurs in these kind of positions where c4 is, and then knight d5 has been played. Don't play passively. Don't put the knight back on e7. Knight d4, this is such an important theme in this whole line. In, in the course, I call this the Trojan horse. You throw your knight into d4, of course, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful piece looking over into white's position. Very often, black sacrifices a pawn. That's the Trojan horse. You know, you give something, but actually, when this pawn is taken, when the knight is exchanged off and white often wins the, the d4 pawn, then actually it will free this bishop and weaken lots of dark squares in white's position. This is a very common theme, and watch what happens here in this game. Well, white decides to exchange queens. I mean, don't black doesn't have to exchange queens. I mean, I think knight d7 is a reasonable move, but um, Mark Sudlu goes for the queen exchange. He's confident with his knight on d4. And again, we see that this knight from f6 actually spins round to a good position. Very much like the King's Indian, except the King's Indian, where this knight has magically appeared on d4 instead of retreating retreating to um, you know e7 or b8. And here, well, you know, white could just occupy the open file here and then king e7. But well Paravian wanted to do something about that knight on d4. It clearly bothered him. And he's thinking, right, I want to win material here. Let's see what Marksudlu has in store. b5, okay, it takes away the c4 square. Bishop b1, white's plan is now becoming very clear. White wants to exchange and then win this pawn. And here I found Marksudlu's next move absolutely fascinating. A move that, frankly, I would not have considered at all really interesting idea. I mean, one could just play king e7 here, for example, but g5, it looks very strange, but as we'll see in the game, this works out perfectly. He realises that white is going to exchange off and then play knight c2 to win the pawn on d4. But what Marksudlu wants to do is make sure that he claims that e5 square. So he doesn't want, for example, the knight to be driven away by f4. And that's why he's played g5. So that can be knocked out and the knight can still head in to e5. But before he allows white to take here, another little subtlety. First of all, rook c4 protecting the pawn. In order to win the pawn, white has to play b3. And now the rook sits on that beautiful square c3. Now finally, white took the pawn. Now, usually I would want to keep that fantastic bishop on g7. It, it's so often when you, when you sacrifice uh, the pawn with this knight d4 move, that bishop just springs to life. Here you've got to be very careful because that knight can hop into one of these beautiful squares. So in this case, Mark Sudlu exchanges off the knight. But now we can see why g5 is played. It's, it's clearer now. That knight is going to head into e5. And here we can see that black has complete control over the c-file. 
Now, how is going to how is Black going to make progress here? You know, you would love to play your rook to the second rank, but of course that square is covered by the bishop. Instantly, what a rotten bishop that is, just blocked in by its own pawns, and particularly when the knight reaches e5. What a contrast between the two minor pieces. It's it, certainly Black cannot make you know, instant progress here. You know, you, you're not going to win in the next five moves. This is a slow burn, basically. But what a pleasant slow burn. All you have to do is think, how do my, I improve my position just a little bit? That's the key to these kind of positions. It's just incremental improvement. So let's watch how Mark Sudlu does this. Remember, white can't do anything here. This is the beauty of black's position. A clear pawn down, but I think with a clear positional advantage. So knight e5. I mean, this, this is a picture, and you can see very clearly that that pawn on g5 fulfills a very important function by preventing f4. King f1. The king comes to the middle. Fine. Still very difficult to see how white is breaking free from this position. Okay, what to do with, with black now? Um, this is very nice. Advance the kingside pawns as far as possible. Bishop heading for a slightly more active square. Bishop e2. I would say the only downside of black's position is potentially these pawns here. You know, if a4 can be played successfully to try and you know loosen these pawns on light squares, but very hard to achieve actually when this rook is here looking at b3. King f6, the king steps up the board, very nice. King e1, g4. Okay, this this is wonderful. Rook b2. I mean, really, you know, white cannot do very much here at all. And now Mark Sudlu makes a, a very positive step. He uses these kingside pawns, h3. So, of course, if that's ex exchanged off, then rook takes, I mean, pawn takes, well, he, he, perhaps pawn takes is possible, but rook takes is clear because you're going to win the h2 pawn. g3, so white keeps it, keeps it close, but the point of playing like this is that now that e4 pawn lacks protection. So knight f3 check. Now, it, it seems such a pity to exchange off that beautiful knight for that absolutely rotten bishop on e2. However, this is just a kind of trade of advantages, and Mark Sudlu appreciates that this exchange will allow black to attack that pawn on e4, and the king is going to step up and takes the place of that fantastic knight. And he just wants to take here. And of course, in playing the pawn to h3, there is a constant threat, potential, to swing the rook round to h1, take on h2, and then that pawn, well, just a couple of steps from queening. So this is just a glorious position for black. Very nice. Keeps control of the C file, um, and of course, if you know if White goes in for um, uh, allows all the rooks to be exchanged off, then of course it's it's an easily winning end game uh, that will drop. But you know the king marches in here. Uh, so I mean here, if rook takes rook, for example, you, know, you can do this here. King takes, and that king will head straight to g2. It's completely winning. Or you could just take here. So rook e2 played to defend the e-pawn. b4, the slow burn again. Um, I mean, I, I think that that rook uh, could have checked and, and gone, gone round here, actually. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. But remember, it's a rapid play game. And Magsudlu is in total squeeze mode. He just wants to squeeze the life out of White completely, and he succeeds. Uh, and now, before he makes any further step, 
F6, very nice, just preventing any kind of weird, you know, pawn sack, just has complete control, so it's an absolutely glorious position. Rook A1, now you could take here and, and move in, but Rook E8, just keeping total control, and now he took. So material is now even, returns to the C file, and now white finally succeeds in getting a little bit of activity, but Mark Sudlu still keeps a lid on everything. You know, I love the way he's just, you know, he's not distracted by um, taking pawns too quickly here. Rookie eight. Just didn't want to allow some pesky check. So he just wants to take here. Rook d3, an exchange of rooks, and the rook comes back to the c file. So now he's a pawn up, but the important thing is he is going for that pawn on b3. Now, white succeeds in capturing the pawn on h3, but... <laughs> You know, it, this this is the kind of race that I, I, I would love to be involved in um, because this one is just way too slow and this one is already far up the board. And there's a second pawn coming as well. That's a nice move, of course. You want to just get the rook in the way and push the pawn. The rook has to come back. And now, of course... It's possible to queen straight away, but the d pawn advances, and here's the trick: the rook comes back, and if white gets a queen, then that can just be taken, and this one goes through. And that was the final move of the game. Uh, let, let's just see what would happen: rook takes, king takes, of course, and then the second. Pass pawn goes through. I mean, this, e even though this is a rapid play game, of course, you know, you could say that or both sides could have played more accurately at certain points. You know, in its own way, this was an absolute masterpiece by Mark Sudlu. And, and, you know, I think in this position, the move that really impresses me is G5. You know, he'd envisaged this kind of position, basically where you know that knight is absolutely supreme on e5 absolutely brilliant and yes this system against c4 with with g6 i think is very very interesting and mark sudlu was was really the pioneer of, of this system so there we go don't forget my kalashnikov course is on sale at the moment on chessable i'll put the the links in in the description um, well, you know, I might, I'll, I'll see if there, there are some more interesting Kalashnikov games coming up soon as well. I, you know, I, I um, want to, want to give you some updates on, on this opening, which I, I think is really worth a shot. Thanks for watching.